Hello everyone, welcome back. It's Tuesday. We're talking art in France after World War I. This is different. We're contrasting this with the prior chapter, which was Western Europe, mostly Germany. We talked about Zurich Dada, Berlin Dada, New York Dada, and a sense of those impacted and involved in the war and how they used that sense of destruction in a reactionary way. Differently in France, after World War I, there was more of a sense of return to tradition, return to classical art, uh, as opposed to avant-gardeism. Here are the questions for today. What is meant by the statement, a call to order? How does it impact artists working after World War I? Um, be sure to um, take notes thoroughly on this. This isn't the only thing that you'll be tested on. I feel like all of you did um, fairly well with the test. Uh, last week, now you know how a test is, uh, but it's very helpful to have good, thorough notes. And this is for the sake of your response. It's into the test, but also just gives me a sense of how much um, you're engaging with the material and how memorable it is in terms of what you're retaining. Um, so first of all, though, I want to start with a prompt. I want you to look at this painting and tell me what you feel looking at this piece. How would you evaluate this piece? How would you analyze it? Thinking about how we've been talking about modern art. Does this fit in to the modern art we've been talking about up to this point? Does it seem peculiar compared to that modern art? Um, or does it really seem to fit in? Okay, so first of all, I want you to pause this and write how this painting makes you feel. And then secondly, if you feel like it fits in, to the sort of, sort of story we've been telling thus far in terms of art. Is it traditional? Is it avant-garde? How does it kind of fit in? Pause it uh, and do like a five minute response looking at this work, okay? Have you pause it here. Once you're finished, I want you to think about this and think about the context of the work. And spoiler alert, I don't want you to hear this next part until you've had a chance to respond and actually write for five minutes in response to this piece. Um, so don't go any further if you haven't written a response. But now, since you've written a response, what I want you to think about is the context for this piece, because context is everything. So this was created at the turn of the century, but it was painted by Adolf Hitler when he was a student studying painting. Now remember, he applied to an art school to be able to study architecture and he was ultimately rejected. He was rejected by a school that was fairly progressive and taught by a lot of Jewish professors. And so a lot of people think that has something to do with his later animosity and obviously um, terrible treatment of Jewish people during the Holocaust. And um, what I want you to consider is the changing of themes in art. Now this is certainly an adequate painting. Uh, recently, some of Adolf Hitler's paintings have gone up for sale. They've been declared by the auction houses as having no artistic value or merit. Instead, they are selling them as historic cultural objects as opposed to art that you would sell for its aesthetic value or what um, we've talked about in terms of its importance in the development of art history. I think that's interesting because I think if someone else perhaps had created this painting, I think it's conceivable that an artist like Magdaliani or Picasso may have done this early in their career uh, prior to becoming a little bit more mature as an artist and seeking to do their own individualistic style. Um, but, you know, it's, it's still art, right? Or is it? Is it not art? How did you feel about this piece? Did it feel interesting, colorful, warm, inviting? It's interesting because one uh, art critic was shown a bunch of Adolf Hitler paintings in, in, the, in the 20th century and asked, what do you think about these works? And he said, these are good paintings. They're decent paintings. But it's interesting how the subject has a sort, sort of uh, lack of interest towards the human figure, um, which in some ways was telling about Hitler as an individual, if you want to read into that a little bit psychologically. Um, but I want you to consider 
you know, the artist's intention when we're looking at some of these works and what's going on at this same time. The first kind of artist that we're going to talk about art in France after World War One is um, the prior work that we looked at, like Picasso and others who had moved to Paris and France had been considered kind of outsiders. And there was a bit of a xenophobia in the earlier 20th century, late 19th century for artists like Van Gogh who wanted to become famous in Paris. Uh, and, and But later, now at the 20th century, after the outset of World War I, they're no longer viewed as kind of suspicious. And School of Paris describes these painters who are in Paris, but outside of uh, for the French culture. So these are outsiders working in Paris. They're named the School of Paris, sort of like Picasso and Magdaliani here. Uh, Amadeo Magdaliani is from Italy. And so if you think about it being an artist trained in Italy and then moving to Paris, he's obviously going to be inspired by Italian art, maybe responding to it, just like the Futurists did. But remember the Futurists said that the warehouses of museums were like mausoleums, trapping art and killing culture. But Magdaliani appreciated Italian art and Renaissance art. Um, and you can see his influence of Titian, the Venuses and Titian's artwork, but also that, you know, those same works inspired Manet's Olympia. This is a painting called Nude. And um, it was considered controversial at its day. They were, some of his nude women were confiscated because of um, how much pubic hair uh, they had in them that was seen as being really shocking. And these weren't meant to be kind of classical paintings. They were much more modern. But he was influenced by archaic art, so early Greek art, and actually Cycladic art as well. So some of you from World Art One might remember the abstract sculptures of the Cycladic culture and um, how they're sort of interesting and almost modern looking, even though they happened like 3,000 years ago. Look at the facial features. There's just a bare minimum, an essence, just gradual tones, not a lot of tones, not super realistic. But there's also a sense of perspective and scale here that a lot of time, a lot of people have referred to these. The point of view of this is almost us. So the the um, implication of a male viewer or us, the viewer hovering over this female figure, and she is presumably ready to um, engage in sex. So she's just been been seen as blatantly sexual, highly um, eroticized female nudes, which is different than some of the nudes that we looked at before, like the nudes of Manet or Matisse or even Mary Cassatt, where they're not as, as, as objectified. But here we see a sense of modernism. And this was an art movement called Les Maudet, which means the cursed. And essentially, it's an art movement, kind of a subgroup of that, that wide-ranging group of the outsider artists in the School of Paris that focused on things that um, felt like society was uh, making artists feel different, that they were cursed. In some way, uh, the artists were poor or alienated from the rest of the society, that their pictures um, explored the uh, bohemian qualities of uh, artists, but musicians um, living in, in a way, a lifestyle that wasn't traditional, a lifestyle that's kind of outside of generally accepted society. So the artists themselves were cursed and their works were cursed because they're showing this kind of like atypical, disorderly, chaotic lifestyle. And I think you can see there's a sense of beauty, but also disorder and chaos in the works of Magdaliani. And I think Magdaliani's work is beautiful. Uh, there's a whole history. Unfortunately, he lived a very brief period. Uh, let's see, 46 years old, which probably sounds old to you, but I'm 44, so 46 sounds young to me. Let's see, no, 36, 1884 to 1920. So he was only 36 years old when he passed away. So really, really young. So unfortunately, we don't, we can't really consider his entire career because there isn't kind of an evolving. He died in the prime of his artist, artistic career. He lived fast and hard. He died from tuberculosis. 
He um, enjoyed drugs and alcohol. He drew and painted obsessively. So even though he had a life short span similar to Van Gogh, he produ produced quite a bit of work in a short lifespan. This is from 1917. I think it's unfortunate the book doesn't talk more about Magdigliani, this Italian artist living in Paris, but I wanted to show you one of his sculptures that's influenced by archaic early Greek sculpture and actually things that predate Greek sculpture. Um, this looks like Cycladic Island sculptures that are from like the um, 2500 BCE era, so really, really old, 3,000 years old. These are dug up around this time, late 19th century, early 20th century, when they're discovered in the Cycladic Islands in Greece, people thought they were fake. They thought they were forgery because they looked so abstract. You kind of get a sense of just a little bit of eyes here, which would have been painted on, no ears, no mouth, but the mouth would have been painted on, and a nose jutting out. And um, artists like Constantine Brancusi and Magdaliani and Picasso were influenced by these sculptures as just being really, really interesting and dynamic. And so you can see a sense of looking back in terms of creating something new. And that's in response to World War I. World War I was a difficult time and they were trying to make sense of the losses inflicted by the war. And instead of the negative animosity that you see in some of the German and American works, instead you see a kind of return to form or return to beauty in a sense. Although in this case, by Chaim Soutin, it is, um, he's a Lithuanian artist, Jewish Lithuanian artist, that um, is using classical themes, like a portrait of a woman, but done so in a distorted, almost grotesque way. And he organized his compositions based around a single color. So a lot of times a portrait like this which he called woman in red, would be a jumping off point, and then everything would be organized, that idea of a red painting. And if you look at the face and the hands, there's a distortion there, almost like this um, older woman is, uh, you know, scowling at us, but also her hands look like they are distorted and contorted because of maybe arthritis or something. But that's an exaggeration, that's a creative freedom that Soutine is taking. And in a way, his works, similar to Francis Bacon, who we'll talk about later, um, make the figures look animalistic or even like very, very uh, fleshy meat, uh, which was another one of his favorite subject matters. He was influenced by Rembrandt. So this painting is called Carcass of Beef. Now I want you to think about this painting. How does this painting make you feel? What's the mood like? Is this pleasant? Does this make you want to go eat a hamburger? Uh, is it disturbing? Does it look realistic? Does it look abstract? And compare it to this. It's based on this painting by Rembrandt from the 17th century called Butchered Ox. So he's looking back. It's not cubism. It's not expressionism. It's sort of traditional. And he actually got this slab of meat, this rapidly decaying carcass. He poured blood from the butcher's shop to refurbish it and to make it glossy and glistening. Actually pissed off his neighbors because it smelled really, really bad. And if you didn't know this was me, you could say this is almost an abstract painting. But you can see the traditional influence kind of going one step further. You can see the Rembrandt composition. But in this case, instead of a, a sense of depth here, and we can understand the space that it's in, here it seems like it's floating, it's in our face, we can't really tell where the background starts and stops, and it's an interesting rendering. So Lithuanian artist, Lithuania is a Baltic uh, country, uh, you know, was once part of Russia, and uh, he worked in Paris as well. So he was, um, he, he started in Paris right before the war's outbreak, he actually studied there, and he hung around artists like Marc Chagall. And Marc Chagall was also from a nearby country, Belarus, which is just on the other side of Lithuania and also had been part of Russia in the early 20th or, and then later the former Soviet Union. So there's a similarity in Marc Chagall's work and also kind of his life trajectory and the younger artist Soutine. 
Uh, the next artist that we're going to talk about is an artist that we've looked at quite a bit. Remember, there's kind of these dual tracks of Matisse and Picasso, and they're both very, very important. And Matisse um, was doing a lot of the things that Picasso had done. He was a little bit older than Picasso, uh, but he, do, he did those things kind of first. He kind of bit, beat him to the punch. But in this case, Matisse is responding to the works that Picasso did. So for the first time, um, instead of Matisse innovating and then Picasso emulating or copying him, here Matisse follows in the footsteps of Picasso and does a, uh, a scene that would have been traditional to him, like that composition called Harmony in Red. Uh, he also did another painting called Red Studio, where instead of painting the world like it actually looked with local color, he adds colors like red to imbue more of a symbolic, uh, aggressive uh, symbolism. And here he's kind of following in the footsteps of Picasso and doing something very cubist in how he lays out the composition. It's not really a cubist painting, but it's Matisse's version of his art now trying to um, keep up with cubism. It doesn't, it isn't too dissimilar from that Collier painting, that open window painting, because here we see a sense of an open window, which is a form that he returns to a bunch, um, or also like the Marc Chagall piece, the window out of uh, looking out at Paris. Um, and he also does a lot of cell French ruffle things where we'll see this comes from another one of his paintings called A Woman in High Chair. This comes from another one of his paintings. It's just a doll's head. And this is one of his sculptures here. So he's kind of revisiting some of his work, but it's called the piano lesson. Harsh geometric angles like the green grass out here cutting through the space outside and actually juts into the inside space here. And the piano here kind of um, forms this pink shape and orange shape here, which is possibly a window curtain uh, and also just how things are laid out. Now this is the doll's head, but it almost looks like a boy sitting at the piano, playing the piano perhaps, even though this was another painting. Instead, there's kind of this ambiguity. Is it a former painting or is it actually a figure in the new composition that's like the teacher teaching a piano le lesson? Uh, so this is from 1916 and you can see his interest in color and an almost abstract arrangement of some traditional things like sculpture, portrait, and self uh, uh, or, or still life here, and then some kind of abstraction keeping up with cubism. Henry Matisse moved to um, Nice in France, and he starts to do a series of odalisques, which are these reclining nude female forms that were seen as exotic. There was an influence from kind of the Ottoman or Persian Empire and also the Middle East. Then we reinterpret those themes first in the tradition of Ang uh, and, and then later in the work of Matisse. There's a great book that also shows uh, all of the Matisse decorative paintings that he did that were much more ornamental. And all of the fabrics, rugs, and wall hangings that he collected that had these amazing uh, decorative patterns on them. He collected French Baroque wallpaper. He collected um, rare Persian rugs and fabrics, and they became the basis for his artworks, which we can see in here. And, and so there's the, also the Japanese influence, there's the Persian, uh, Ottoman, Middle Eastern influence, and then the classical influence of earlier artists like Cezanne, but very, very classical like M Michelangelo, um, Raphael, and Greek sculptures. So there's kind of a return to classical themes. I think when you have a war as horrific as World War I, with like we said last time, 10 million dead soldiers, 20 million injured, you can go one of two ways. You can go in the way of um, very, very horrific and kind of showing like Otto Dix and George Gross, showing us what it's like in the trench, or you can go the opposite way and go, we need to return to beautiful things. Some of these artists said, I didn't think I'd be able to ever paint again because of World War I. And so they're saying, if I'm gonna to return to painting, I wanna do something beautiful. I wanna give people hope as opposed to all of this despair. You can really see it in this time period with Matisse's decorative work. 
His work is very decorative and we would say kind of ornamental like the Rococo period right after the Renaissance. This is where he really slips into a certain beauty and pattern, very simplified. He called this period as an art of the essentials. Just give me the bare essentials of what I need. It doesn't have to have depth. It doesn't have to have a sense of three-dimensional modeling. It's making it even more abstracted and simplified. And this is getting to um, a period where he's really thinking about balance, harmony, color, simplified shapes, and devoid of depressing subject matter. And this is what he said. He said his desire, especially considering what's going on around him, is his desire to create an art of balance, of purity and serenity, devoid of troubling or depressing subject matter. And art would be something like a good armchair, right? Something that's comfortable to allow us to rest from physical fatigue. So he saw us sort of settling into his painting like a comfortable armchair. It's not there to remind you of the sad, depressing, horrific things going on around you. It's there as a respite, as a counterpoint to the difficult times. It's there as, a, as an escape from that as well. He also had the opportunity to do some decorative art. So his work was decorative, but he also did some decorative arts, some um, murals and some mosaics. This was called the Marion Dance Mural, which was at the Barnes Foundation in Marion, Pennsylvania. In addition to a lot of uh, Russian collectors, you can see a lot of works by Matisse in the Hermitage in St. Petersburg in Russia. But you can also see a lot of his works at the Barnes Foundation in Pennsylvania because um, Barnes had been one of his biggest collectors and he invited him to do a mural in this space. And what happened was he got the wrong dimension. So he realized about halfway through the project that he was making a site-specific painting, but he had the scale wrong. So he had to start over. But in that process of starting over, it's kind of like if you ever are writing a paper and you're almost finished and boom, you turn off the power on a computer and you, and you turn it, restart it, turn it back on, and it's no longer there. But the second paper kind of gets you quicker to those points and ideas in the, in the first, and this, a lot of times the second variation is better, is, uh, is more uh, reflective of a summation of your ideas. And that's what he was doing with this. He also discovered that in doing an outline of all of the figures, which you can see these kind of looked like his Joy of Life painting, these dancing figures that are turning and twisting in this space in these sort of three-dimensional architectural niches, he um, realized that when he painted the outline and had to fill them in with color, that that took too long for him to make changes that he wanted to do. So what he discovered was he could just take large sheets of colored paper, cut them apart, make additions, deletions on it, and then do the painting based on that. Ultimately, he threw those away, but later in his life, when he was no longer able to paint and draw large scale because of a physical impediment, uh, and he was, uh, you know, he had to stay in a wheelchair most of the day, he found that this was a way for him to make paintings. And he actually made these paper cuts or collages in the 50s that then became mosaics. And I've had an opportunity, and these are supposed to be nude figures right here, this one is, within, and then just decorative forms. I've seen one of these in, in, uh, in real life. They're beautiful, they're amazing. But he would kind of create a sketch with these paper collages and then someone else would execute it in tile. Um, what's going on with Picasso at this time? This is interesting because, you know, we tend to think about sometimes a trajectory of an artist first starting, learning to study in an academic tradition, and then maybe mimic mimicking other people's style, and then finding your own voice, refining that voice and getting more avant-garde or more experimental as you go. Picasso kind of broke the rules of tradition and he actually returns to a more realistic. So this is something that you'd maybe expect to see earlier in someone's career. He's doing it at the same time that he's doing cubism. And it's because of this idea of a call 
to order that Jean Cocteau talked about uh, with um, artists wanting to return to a simpler time as opposed to avant-garde experimentation or radical abstraction, let's return to styles and themes that are easier for people to understand and get. Because if you've gone, if you're a viewer, if you're a patron, if you're buying a painting, you might prefer something simple as opposed to something obtuse or esoteric that maybe challenges you too much. This is actually a portrait of one of his collectors and a collector could make or break an artist's career. Sometimes a collector or a dealer would buy the entire studio contents from an artist and they would then hold on to that and sell some of the works piece by piece. And remember the gallerist of uh, Toulouse-Lautrec that did the At the Moulin Rouge, remember that with the garish face of the woman in the foreground? He cut that piece up. So a lot of times a dealer or a collector could have a big impact on an artist's uh, ability to sell. Sometimes the dealer would buy the contents of the entire studio and sit on it until that artist became famous, sell those works for more, uh, or show them little by little and let them out as they wanted to. So a lot of times the fate of the artist was in the hands of the dealer. But here we see Ambrose Villard who had a great relationship with Picasso and to Picasso's advantage was a, had a great ability to sell his works. So Picasso became very wealthy, very famous, uh, and returned here to classical styles of art and realism. Isn't this interesting? This is about uh, uh, eight years after he paints Demoiselle d'Avignon, right? Les Demoiselles d'Avignon is the ladies of the street, that fractal cubist, first cubist, proto-cubist painting. He did that first, then this later. And by the time people are starting to see that man, like, oh my gosh, look at what Picasso did. He's changing the name of the game. The future of art depends on Picasso. Nobody can paint like they used to paint. Nobody can paint like the Renaissance anymore. Now it's all new, it's all modern, it's all avant-garde and abstract, and then boom. Picasso says, no, you still can paint like the old masters. Look at me do it right here. And this is a portrait of his first wife, who was a dancer, who he was introduced to when he was asked to create costumes, really fanciful, Dada-esque costumes for a parade, this French festival of dance and music and acting, um, and very progressive in this parade. He meets Olga, he marries her, and he paints her for a long time as they're married, and eventually starts to paint her. He starts painting her as very, very beautiful towards the end of their marriage as it starts to uh, fall apart. He starts to paint her as unrealistically ugly because trying to represent the emotion of their relationship as opposed to the reality of her outward appearance. Picasso was definitely a misogynist. We can say that without doubt. He was a womanizer. He had many wives, many mistresses, visited brothels. And so even though here he has a beautiful application of paint that reflects the beauty of Olga seated in this armchair. We know what's going to happen. We know where this story ends, and it's not a great story for Olga, honestly. Um, and even though this painting isn't finished, we can still see it as a masterpiece, as a beautiful painting in the tradition of the old masters. I think it's so interesting. Think, think of a band like Radiohead, for instance. I don't know if any of you are fans of radio. Head. Maybe Ashlyn is. Yeah, I know Ashlyn likes a lot of 90s grunge music. Radiohead started in very traditional kind of guitar rock modality. And then later, um, they started to get more and more experimental, almost techno-like, electronic, to the point where where were the guitars? They were known as a guitar band. But it's like, can, can you put that back? You can't put it back into the box once you've kind of built this thing and then destroyed it. Can you imagine if Radiohead then came out with a very traditional album that sounded like Oasis or something from the 90s. People would be like, what is this, right? That's what Picasso does. He got more and more 
avant-garde, but then yet he put Pandora back in the box. He went back to realism, he went back to classicism in his work as well. We can see, just like Matisse had a Greek influence and Amadeo Magdigliani had a Greek influence, an archaic influence, we can see it in Picasso's work as well during this period. This is some of his most enigmatic and interesting work. I think it's very poetic. A whole body of work that is very sculptural and Greek. He did some self-portraits in this vein as well. This is called The Pipes of Pan, where he's exploring mythology and Greek forms. These look very, very classical and sculptural, but also symbolic, I think, like works by Marc Chagall. Uh, and later even surrealist work. Picasso kind of beat the surrealists to the punch, but he never himself was a surrealist artist. But you can kind of see some ideas of like De Chirico in this where it seems symbolic, like what is going on in this space? Here's what's really weird about Picasso. He never truly abandons cubism. He keeps it there as a way to continue to explore art. And so this is a cubist painting that happens during the same period as his realism and his classical uh, portraits. It's a way of saying I've got more in me than just one trick, not a one trick pony, and I got more styles in me. I mean if you just look at one style of artists like the blue period, the rose period, his, his paintings that incorporate early cubism, later cubism, uh, his works that are very classical. That was, any, that was enough for any artist to sustain an entire career. It's like he has lifetimes as an artist and not just one life or one uh, art style or aesthetic. This is an interesting cub cubist piece and, and many people have theorized that this is perhaps a portrait of Picasso in the center. So a self-portrait, picturing himself as a harlequin, which we saw earlier anyways when he did his Sultan Bank paintings where he pictured himself like a clown, the artist as a clown, as sort of a performer for an audience, kind of putting on a shtick. And uh, these clowns that went around and performed were generally kind of poor, lived on the outskirts of Paris, and he related to those as well. On the left is a portrait of his friend, the poet Apollinaire, who fought in the war, and Pierrot, the poet that was also part of these kind of famous clown scenes or street performers playing a flute. So Apollinaire was a poet, and so it makes sense that he would be Perrault the clown or Perrault the poet. And then on the far right is Max Jacob, his friend, the writer, who was very influential um, in the early avant-garde scene with our, um, other writers like Apollinaire and also Gertrude Stein. And here we see him as a monk because he had actually left the world and took up residence in a monastery. So it would make a lot of sense that these are three random musicians, but they're also Picasso and his two friends, which I think is really, really brilliant. And you know, with earlier works as well, he did self-portraits, he did a lot of symbolism, and he did with the Sultan Banks and also the Blue Period, where he did paintings of his friend um, Carlos Casagimas, who had died by suicide. This is a bust of Apollinaire, so the poet Apollinaire, who was really, really important for early uh, uh, modernism, Dada artists uh, for the for for these artists like friends with Matisse, friends with Modigliani, friends with Picasso. Uh, and here's a great poem. I think it helps to see some of the context and the primary sources. So go ahead and pause this and read this poem by Apollinaire. And this is a bust of Apollinaire created by Picasso in Paris, and it is in this field. Uh, uh, this garden that's in the center of this courtyard and he died much earlier than Picasso did and he died um, prior to um, I think the most avant-garde period of Picasso's career as well um, but he was someone that supported him and encouraged him in his art Probably Picasso's most famous piece ever and one of the most important paintings of the 20th century, if not the most important painting of the 20th century, is this. Pablo Picasso's Guernica. And Guernica is the hometown of Picasso, where he was born. And what happened during 
uh, World War II in 1937, because of the Spanish Civil War, Nazi Germany, under the influence of Hitler, bombed Spain to help Franco win the Spanish Civil War. And Picasso sided with the idea uh, uh, against the Spanish fascists. And so this piece was a protest of the war and of a dictator in Franco and Spanish fascists. So we see the sense of atrocity, atrocities. This is a huge painting. It's very large in scale, 12 feet tall by 26 feet long. This is huge. This is like a mural, the size of a mural. And originally this was in New York for the entirety of, since Picasso painted it, up until the point where he died and even after. Picasso said, as long as I'm alive and as long as there is a fascist dictator in control in Spain, I don't want this painting there. But the second it gets returned to an anti-fascist government, then it can be returned. And so that, you know, technically happened in the 70s, but 70s, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't actually shipped there until later. So up until that time, it was in New York. And there is a recreation of this, interestingly enough, that had been donated to um, the United Nations building as a reproduction, a large-scale tapestry that has just recently been taken down. It was taken down during, during the Trump administration, not by choice, but because the um, Rockefeller uh, estate that had funded it had said that it was going to be up until a certain date. It was well past that, and so the estate took it back, which I think is really interesting. But they wanted that to be in that space intentionally to warn of the atrocities of war. And so let me walk you through this. Let's unpack this a little bit about how this is traditional and in which ways it's experimental. First of all, there's a really strong triangular structure to this. If you kind of follow from the hand up through the mother here to this candle and then down this angle to the foot here, really strong triangular structure. That was really common in the Renaissance and in Rubens and, and in art um, that was very classical, okay? So that was definitely something, even though this is an avant-garde painting, it has a traditional foundation to it. Also, there are some elements that quote Rubens, the, the famous artist from, um, from the, uh, the Flemish area, Belgians, Belgian, which had been part of the Netherlands at one point. Uh, and you can see some elements like this hand that's reaching in, the very diagonal structure coming in that comes from Rubens paintings. We can see the eye here, which is meant to be the all-eyeing, all-knowing, seeing eye of God, illuminating what appears to be both an interior and an exterior view at the same time. We see a bull or a minotaur, which um, Picasso used in the minotaur quite a bit as a self-portrait from his Spanish heritage, but also this kind of Greek mythology of him being part refined man, part beast, uncontrollable. Uh, he really identified with that, but also a Spanish history of bullfights, right? Uh, Picasso explored that quite a bit. You see a mother here crying out, reaching up, holding her dead baby. And this was a messenger here who's now dead, holding a broken sword, being trampled by a horse who's also been stabbed and is dying and is crying out in pain. Here is this kind of uh, outside figure illuminating this scene and another figure over here in this building that's recently been bombed. A lot happening. It's a scene of terror and destruction, but it's also simplistic. Even though it's huge and there's a lot going on, it's really, really angular, it's monochromatic. It's mostly black and white with some grays in it. If you squint at this, this painting is almost just all black and white with some grays, right? Or in other words, it has a lot of darkness contrasted with very bright highlighted sections. But you can see a sense of agony with the protagonists, women, uh, children, people that are a sense of victims in this, and there's no winners. It's very, very powerful. It's expressionistic, and it's cubist in a time when Picasso had almost entirely abandoned cubism. He felt this was the best way to render this scene. 
to me, the use of black and white has a feel like a newsreel, which would have been common at this time, and also a, a newspaper. These are the ways that people would have learned about what's going on with the atrocities of war, right? Newspaper, but it's guided sometimes by political and biased viewpoints, or a newsreel might be a propaganda by a local state government. But here we see the truth, the true meaning in this kind of black and white uh, reality. Uh, it's either black or, or white truth or fiction, and it, there's no lying here. He was trying to tell us the story in a journalistic way like you would see in a newspaper. Beautiful painting, very important. Now it's in Madrid, now it's back in Spain. Really, really interesting work. And I think in terms of the, the, the um, canon, right, what, pa what paintings should be in our history books. If you only have an hour to go to a museum, which one of the highlights are you going to hit? Why is Mona Lisa one of da Vinci's, Leonardo's uh, best paintings? Maybe it isn't, but it's, the, it's one of the most iconic. And why? And Picasso is able to boil down the essentials, sum up the tragedies of all of World War I and World War II into the bombing of his hometown, his homeland, Guernica in Spain. And it's a beautiful statement, but it's also a tragedy of a statement. And you can see how he quotes other works such as this. Look at the hand here with the candle, right? And this is an etching that he did that predates this. And here we see the hand with the candle, right? We see a figure on a, land, on a ladder with a beard here. We see the minotaur, part human, part bull. Um, which we see here as well. So the Spanish kind of tradition that's in it. And this horse uh, that's in the center of this etching that he did. Um, and he created hundreds of sketches, many, many variations. So this is something that was really near and dear to his heart. And he didn't just kind of whip it up in, in, in like one kind of setting of like getting it out of his system. He was very thoughtful and intentional and uh, careful in terms of where he placed everything. This is on my bucket list, I haven't seen it yet, but if you go to Madrid, um, if you go to Spain, you'll be able to see in Barcelona, the Gaudí architecture. If you go to Madrid, you can see this painting, Velázquez paintings, you can see paintings by Hieronymus Bosch. Really, really cool, important painting. The last artist that we're gonna talk about is Fernand Leger. And Leger was an artist that had been part of the Cubist movement and then later, um, again, the same idea of call to order, of simplified forms, simplified art, art that's easier to get, more pleasing, easier to understand. Uh, Leger uh, changes his art and uh, makes it a little bit more consistent with those ideals. Uh, but it still is a reflection on the city around us. Uh, the cacophony of noise, of modernism, of buildings going up quickly. We can see kind of machine-like qualities in the background and the figures themselves, although there's a balance of organic and geometric. And these nudes, especially their breasts, become like shapes in and of themselves. They become like three-dimensional sculpted spheres. The hair becomes very uh, uh, formulaic. And even this figure here in an earlier variation of this painting had been the same gray flesh tones here, but he does it now in this color to kind of make it stand out a little bit, these three women. Uh, really interesting series and kind of a reflection of his ideas, which he really wanted to sum up his own experiences of uh, what was going on in society and also what it meant to be part of a modern society. What he was imagining is, okay, I'm looking at the artwork of Raphael, but Raphael made work that was about the Renaissance, about what was going on then. What if Raphael lived today in the 1920s and the 1930s, and Leger is saying, this is just, I'm an artist, and this is just what's coming out of me because I'm regurgitating and inspired by everything that is around me. So they're still somewhat realistically drawn uh, but it's very, very abstract at the same time. We know there are three figures. We know they're, they're in a space with a still life and the couch and the, the cat in the background um, and these abstract-like paintings in the background. But we also 
um, see it as being a, a combination of shape and color and form to make it interesting, pleasing to the eye. So that someone coming at this can be like, ah, I understand very easily what this is about and I like the way that it's arranged. That kind of sums up the ideas of call to order and French art, art that's happening in Paris, which is a huge capital, still the art mecca for everyone in Europe and some of these artists and even in the United States going to Paris to make art and to sell art because that's kind of where it's all happening. Don't forget, write your responses. Peace out. Enjoy. See y'all. Thanks.